there's we might go over in time i'm just letting you guys know that now <laughs> so um there's so much here and it's just it, it's heartbreaking okay first and foremost we were reminded once again israel had no king yes israel had no physical king a human king right and at this point, the judges are done. We're not really going to talk about the judges anymore. The rest of the judges is pretty much just the downfall or the rest of the downfall of the Israelites during this time period. The sad part about all this is, and I'm going to, I have scripture written here because I, I don't want you to think I took anything out of context, okay? Um, but I'm, for time's sake, I won't read it all, but it's there for you guys to go back and you can read it yourself. Um, but essentially, the sad part about this whole thing Okay, they were searching for this land. They took it from these peaceful people, right? They had more than enough land. This was already decided. Joshua 19, 40 through 48 lays out the land that was specifically given to every tribe, which includes the Danites. But that land wasn't good enough for them because they had to actually work to get it. They had to defeat a really bad, harsh army to get it. They had no trust or faith in God to do it. See, every time we see God showing up in a big way, the odds are against the one that has God on their side, but they always prevail. Yet somehow the Israelites forgot this over and over and over again. It wasn't them that was going to win the battle. See, it's never about us. It's about allowing God to use us as a vessel. That's when we're our strongest, is when God's working through us. When we try and do things on our own, we will fail. We will. See, the Danites... Even though they were already given land, they were already promised it. They were already foretold that this land will be yours. They didn't want to take it over. Okay? So there was no reason for them to ask this Levite priest, is this in God's will? I could have told them, no. It's not. You already told the land that you were supposed to have, that's your inheritance. You just don't want to do the work to get it. They failed to trust God in helping them clear their land. The Amorites forced them into the hillside right? We read this in Judges 1, 34. We're already told they were scared. How many times do we face an army or something fierce and we shy away? We serve a God bigger than this, yet somehow we keep putting God in a box that fits our understanding. How many times in the Old Testament can we read when God showed up, it didn't matter human understanding because God doesn't live in human understanding. Instead of trusting God and working for the land that was promised them, they instead looked for land that was easier. Now as believers today, how often do we do the same thing? God, I want to know you more. God, I want to do your will. God, I want to do your ministry. Oh, FYI, I don't want to do work to get there. I just want to snap my fingers and it happens. That's not reality. See, much like how a diamond's formed, we get prepared for ministry by God pressuring us, changing us, molding us. It's never easy to do God's ministry. Even though it's easy when we follow God and we trust God, but it doesn't mean it's easy. See, there's a difference between trusting and not stressing and things being easy. God, if you want God to call you to ministry and you want to do something for God, trust me when I tell you, it will not be easy. There will be hard times. But see, that's when we, church, we turn to God. We trust God. It was their journey to the north for a different land that some of the men stole idols. So here we go. Do you think God honors them stealing stuff? And of all things, idols. The journey was not blessed. Instead of seeking God and his will for them, th they went about their own way. So some of you might be asking the Levite, like, why is the Levite priest? And I've even been asked, well, who is the Levite priest? I don't know. It's a Levite priest. That's all I know. Um, but I put this in here, and again, for time's sake, I'm not going to read it. But Numbers 3, 5 through 13 tells you why in this specific time, they were Levite priests. Um, that's where they came from. That's where God called them out of. And essentially, what are Levite priests? They were the light to the light of the world. If that makes sense. 
So you have the Israelites that are the light of the world. The Levites were to be the light to the Israelites for the Israelites to be the light of the world. I think I said that right. Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, so essentially they were set apart from birth. And, it will, and in this verse will tell you that. Um, God said, no, the Levite men, the firstborn, just like out of Egypt, they are to be those that do uh, look after the temple that do the different synagogue things, that teach the Israelites heritage, that teach the Israelites how to worship me, you know, God. And unfortunately, we don't see that in this Levi priest, do we? So Levi priests and their assistants, right? Because we hear about the assistant as well. They were to serve the people of Israel in a spiritual matter of God. In return, they were to be taken care of by the Israelites. So I want to take a moment, okay, we can get on the Levite, Levite priest right now, right? And be like, oh, he didn't do his job. He was supposed to be leading them. How dare he? Well, first and foremost, their trust was in the wrong person. Their trust always should have been in God. Like even today, I am human as a pastor. Chances are I will let you down. I will do something wrong eventually. I will say something wrong or stupid or whatever it may be because I'm not perfect. That's why you don't put your trust in me. I'm here to guide you. I'm here to help you understand the word. I'm here to do many, many things. But I am not the one anyone should ever follow. I'm, I'm here to guide, give examples, teach. Our trust, our hope should always be founded in Christ. And if it's not, this world will let you down. I will let you down. The church will let you down. It's vital that that's where our hope and trust is always in. Not man of any kind. But here's the problem. So we can turn on this Levi and say, wow, he even led them astray. As a, a priest or a pastor or whatever you want to call them, essentially today, that he was a pastor essentially. Maybe, uh, obviously a little different. When the Israelites fell away from God, they stopped supporting the priest in the Jewish temples, okay? They did not have a normal job. Their job as a Levi priest 24-7 was to teach God, praise, worship, the whole thing. When the Israelites started walking away from God and doing idols, do you think they were still giving to the temple? Do you think they were still taking care of these priests that that was their only job? No. So unfortunately for him, and again, am I saying what he did was correct in walking away and going to Micah and everything he did, no. But unfortunately, he wasn't being taken care of. His needs were not being met. He had to find a way to feed and clothe himself with his entire life. He never had to. So he was put in a compromised situation, and now look what happened. It was no longer about God can provide for me. It's I got to take care of myself. And it was just a downward spiral. They were to perform the rituals. God chose people, the Levites, were chosen even more for God's purpose, right? Israel forgot the God, their God, and because of their, they forgot to take care of their God, they forgot to take care of the priest. It was a vicious, vicious cycle. So now let's specifically look at this Levi priest in chapter 17 and 18. So first and foremost, what we would have read in that other book, right? There were specific places that they were to worship only, like temples, certain cities, things of that nature, okay? That's where they were supposed to only teach God's word, learn God's word, and those things. So the first thing that we can see that he was not doing correctly, he performed his duties in a house, okay? Next, they were only supposed to be performed in tabernacles and designated cities. So the purpose of why God said only in these areas was so that uh, if the teaching and perform was to keep the priest from changing God's law. See, that was the thing. When he went to this individual's house and he was the household priest, he was worshiping idols. He was worshiping all these other things under the sun. That's a bad thing. He carried, carried idols with him and worshiped them. He claimed to speak God for God when he clearly didn't even ask God what the right thing was. 
We saw this already. His words were counter to what God had already proclaimed. He took his calling and purpose and he used it for selfish gain, right? To food, money, things that were tangible that he needed. So what is the causality of, the, of their actions? So through this entire chapter, and honestly the entire book of Judges, no one is truly seeking and desiring to worship God. That's what it comes down to. They're not following God. They're not worshiping God. They're out for themselves and what makes them feel good and what's good for them. No one turned to God to find their purpose or will or anything else. They all sought after selfish gain, material, things that they wanted. They only use God and his name for their personal agenda and advancement. It's essentially what we see the Levi priests do. It's essentially what we see the Danites do. Some come to feel better to be... um, So today we can see the same within like our churches, right? We can see the same thing in church leadership and everything else, right? So I challenge you, why do you come to church? Some come to feel better to be accepted relieve guilt, gain business, contacts to manipulate individuals for a variety of reasons, money, power, so the list goes on and on, right? They will even use God to advance their own personal agenda and means of worldly achievement. See, it's dangerous when we use God out of context. It's dangerous when we sit there and say, well, this is what I feel God's word says. Well, guess what? Your feelings are not fact. I hate to tell you. You cannot sit there and use God for yourself or for gain. It doesn't work that way. The people do it all the time. So let me talk about this real quick before I get to my final thoughts and notes. Was the tribe of Dan right in their quest of the city of Laish? You see the top marking. (laughs) Simple answer? No, they weren't. God gave the Israelites specific commands to destroy certain people. Now, see, he did this because he wanted them to go after the places in the promised land where there was wickedness. Right? We talked about this in Romans. We talked about this earlier in Judges. He wanted them to wipe these people out for a very specific reason. Right? We learn about this. When sin enters, no matter how small, and we don't abolish that sin, it doesn't go away. Right? When we start accepting a sin and saying everyone sins and it's okay and we're just going to do the love part of everything, that sin wins. It doesn't go away. God specifically told the Israelite tribes to go to certain places because he wanted the wickedness, he wanted the idolatry gone because he knew if it stayed around, the Israelites would fall. And they did, didn't they? See, same thing with us today. We want to say that God's controlling in all these other things, right? That God does this and he only wants to control. He doesn't want me to have fun. No, he wants you to be healthy. He wants you to stay away from things that are bad. That is why sin is sin and biblical truth is biblical truth. Whether our feelings or opinions like it or not. He wanted these people wiped out and destroyed because he knew if it wasn't, it would eventually take them over, and it did. So Deuteronomy 13, which is essentially about worshiping other gods. I'm going to try and go through this real quick. Um, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces so essentially what this is all talking about again i wanted people to read this that's why i put it on there is talking about how we should always question if people are speaking biblical truth or not and if we go to the next slide there's a part of it that's in white and again i want please go through and read this entire chapter for yourself because it kind of correlates to everything i'm talking about today Um, but for time i don't want to read the whole thing but specifically the white is what relates to the danites If you hear it said about one of these towns the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that troublemakers have arose among you and you have led the people of their town astray, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods you have not known, then you must inquire, probe, and investigate it thoroughly. And if it is true and it has been approved that the 
uh, detestable things have been done among you, you must certainly put to the sword all who live in that town. You must destroy completely both its people and its livestock. Now, like I said, please don't take just that. Please go back and read all of Deuteronomy 13, okay? Because it speaks in volumes about people not saying the right thing and what you should do with them. There's even a section in this passage that speaks about if your son, your wife, right, is not being biblically and they want to lead you astray, kill them. I mean, it, it, and again, I understand in today's terms, that's a little, that's, that's a little intense, but the idea behind it is this. God told them to go to these specific areas in the promised land to destroy the evil so it didn't affect them. They didn't. And what happens? Right? We see it again here. If you go to a town that I told you to go to, they don't, God did not even want them to keep any relics of theirs because he knew they could become gods or idols. There's a reason why God said destroy the livestock, destroy the buildings, destroy all the plunder, destroy all the people. Because if any of it existed, it was going to destroy them. And guess what it did? It destroyed them. They fell in love with their idols, their money, their treasures, their people. Right? We're warned how many times do not intermingle. Right? Don't go with one of their wives or their uh, go, don't go with one of their daughters or their sons, right? Why? Because then you will start believing in their gods. Don't do it. So what's the takeaway? Micah had ephod and made idols and even hired a priest to run his personal religion. And if you remember, ephod is a ceremonial vest that priests wore, Jewish priests. When the men of Danites took it, it destroyed him. It left him with nothing. And all I could think about was how heartbreaking would that be? We have a world right now that doesn't believe in a creator. And with all this chaos and craziness around us, my heart breaks for them. Because what an empty, fearful world that would be without knowing that we serve something bigger than us. A God that's bigger than all of this. And we got to remember that, you know, when, we, when we're talking about this specific story, idol is a statue or something that reminds someone of something, okay? But today, idols can be anything we make and put above God. An idol could be your spouse. An idol could be money, a job. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, okay? There's nothing wrong with having stuff, as long as it doesn't take the place of God. That's the problem. A true personal relationship with God, right? My personal relationship with God. I'm not talking about the church as a body, a physical building. Okay, I'm talking about your and my one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. If that's true, if that's genuine, everything can be taken from us, including our Bibles, okay? Let's just say everything is stripped away from us. And we have nothing. Not even a Bible to hold. That relationship, if built properly, will never go away. It will never be destroyed. That's the reason Christians are who we are. We serve a living God that's within us. Someone we can talk to. It's not about a place, a temple, doing something specific. It's about that personal relationship with him. Yet so many of us don't even understand that. See, when his stuff was taken, his idols, his, his vest, his robes, and all those things, he was destroyed. He felt empty because he was worshiping things that weren't real. Instead of worshiping the God that is real, that does exist, that would not be, cannot be taken from us, we have to choose to lose and choose to walk away to lose God. It breaks my heart. See, the only way we can truly protect against this is we got to pray. we got to stay in the Word. we got to seek after God. It takes time. It takes effort. We need to 
make sure that we give God the glory, that we give back to God. That, and again, people probably hear me say give back and they think money. I, it's not about money. When I say give back to God, I mean when something happens, God is the glory. When something's accomplished, God gets the glory. That our whole lives are centered around God, not just part. We can never lose God if we are seeking and trying to follow him. This is actually something that I picked up from Wendy. Um, for those that are watching, Wendy's my wife. Um, she grew up in the church, and she always questions if she really knows God. And, and again, my wife knows God. She's got an amazing heart. But what's so heartbreaking is because of different churches she's been a part of, she was even questioning her own relationship. I'm telling you, the Bible tells us if we're seeking and searching after him, that's what he cares about. It's not that we do every prayer right. It's not that we do everything correctly. It's that we're seeking, truly seeking after him for the right reasons. We're seeking after him for that relationship, not to get something. God is not a genie. Okay? He's not. And that's not what it's about. When everything is stripped away, it is then we truly see who we're following. More than that, will we know if God is our world or just part of it? Now, this last part is going to probably get uncomfortable. And I, and I know that we're we're pushing the time. This was really, really put on my heart this week. And I can't explain it any other way than that. Um, and I, and I kind of put this in there. Um, just because they were victorious in Laish does not make their actions right. So what do I mean by that? Church leaders and congregations today justify their actions with outward signs of success. So what do I mean by that? And again, this is not all churches across the board. This is not, this is a general statement, okay? If a mega church or another church, they typically try and post their achievements or how many people come and all those things, right? As their way of justifying God's favor, as their way of justifying that they're doing things the right way. I'm here to tell you that's not true. They think wealth, prosperity, popularity, fame, influence, and even more than those, that a lack of suffering means they are being blessed by God. It doesn't. If anything, it means the exact opposite. And I've been talking to people about, you know, saying like, I'm following God. I feel like I'm doing everything right. Why do I feel like I'm being punished? And what I told these individuals, and I honestly, I've told myself before too, and this is kind of what the Bible says. Not kind of, it is what the Bible says. Forgive me for that. If you have a church of a million people, yet no one's being saved, no one's relationship is growing in Christ, would Satan not want that church to prosper? If you have a church of 20 where lives are being transformed, people are growing, people are meeting people where they're at, people's lives are changing, which church do you think is going to suffer? Often, again, often, not always, worldly success is accompanied by evil and wrongdoing. And I know I'm going to have people that say, no, I don't agree with that. Here's the thing. Remember, the media, the world tells us what we want to hear. A lot of times what we see and hear on the media is not always the truth. Just because it's being said or stated doesn't make it fact. Just because someone appears to be good doesn't mean they are. And this is not me saying you can judge whoever you want, okay? What I'm saying is make sure, like we were told in a lot of these passages, do your research. Look into an individual. Look into the motives. Look into what's going on to find out why these things are being done and said. Then, through God, figure out what the right answer is. See, quick judgment of just saying, oh, well, they're whatever, that's a problem. But if you sit there and be like, okay, 
what is really going on, you study, you pray, it's, you're going to find the right answer. Do not, and please, these next three, please take to heart. Do not allow worldly success to measure whether an individual is pleasing or favoring to God. See, oftentimes, if we have money or if we don't, oh, well, this person's being blessed, this person's not. N no, that's not true. Or, well, this person uh, has a church of 900, this one has a per church of 10. Obviously, this church of 900 is doing the right thing. No, it doesn't. We live in a fallen world where we try and put biblical truth in a fallen world. Why do you think it's so counterintuitive when Jesus says things like, when Jesus washed the feet, name one politician, name one famous person that would wash yours or my feet. Yet Christ did it. Yet somehow we think the world can prove to us if God's blessing them or not. Christ even said, the last will become first, the first will become last. Worldly ideology, no, you work, you do what you need to, stab people in the back, burn bridges, whatever you need to do to become first. Yet again, we judge worldly accomplishments to justify if God's blessing them or not. And one more point about this. Feelings and opinions do not make it biblical fact. God's word makes it fact. Just because you don't agree with it or you have a problem with it does not make it not biblical truth. Biblical truth is biblical truth. Your facts of opinion don't matter. We are in a fallen, hard world because we have decided we want to make God and the Bible say what we want it to say. We have churches divided, Christians separated, families torn apart because we want to sit there and say, nope, the Bible says this. Nope, the Bible says this. Nope, no. How about you read the Bible and let the Bible tell you what it's saying? Not the other way around. Stop using God's name and the Bible and taking his love and grace out of context. Yes, God has love, grace, and mercy for us all because we all need it. Yes, we all sin and fall short. That does not justify the sin. And that doesn't justify us saying, well, we all sin, so I'm going to accept them just the way they are. Just like it doesn't give the other side of this equation the right to judge, condemn, and burn down people for maybe sinning differently than they do. What it does mean is we need to be biblically truthful at all times. And instead of just condemning an individual, loving on them, helping them work through it, and building them up. But here's the problem. You can't do that if you keep telling the world... If they know you're a Christian, especially, well, we all sin, so you're right. It's okay. Do whatever you want. No. It doesn't work that way. That's why our world is the way it is. We have Christians too scared to think, to tell biblical truth because you don't want to offend or hurt anybody. Or if you bring somebody out, you sit there and say a sin is a sin well, then that means I don't love them. No, yes, it does. Just like when I get on my children for misbehaving and I tell them what they're doing is wrong, it's not that I want to condemn them or banish them. It's because I love them and I want them to stop doing the wrong thing. We all sin. We all fall short. But stop justifying sin. The Israelites kept falling and falling and falling because no one stood up and said, stop. Sin is sin. We love you all. God loves you. God shows you grace and mercy, but sin is sin. Stop justifying sin. Sin. 
Remember, yes, we all have that grace, that love, and that mercy, and we all need it. And all too often, churches don't give enough of that part. But at the same time, there's too many churches just saying, we all sin, so I'm going to accept people from where they're at. No. We're to accept people where they're at, walk life with them as God transforms their life, not to accept the sin and let them continue sinning. There's a huge, huge difference. The Israelites kept falling. A village was entirely annihilated because the Israelites didn't stop sinning. They didn't stop. They just kept helping each other sin. What do you think we're doing today? Why do you think our world is the way it is? Stop. The Bible is the Bible and is biblical truth. Whether you agree with it or not, it is. You're right. Churches all too often have condemned people, shunned them, and pushed them aside. And I am not saying that is biblically correct. I'm not even saying that's correct as a human being. But our world is the way it is because we're just accepting sin for sin. See, calling someone out in their sin is not condemning them. It is if you walk away after doing it. We need to start loving people so much that we're willing to walk life with them and we're willing to have the hard conversations with them. But after doing this, loving on them, showing them the grace that we've been given. But just because we all sin doesn't mean we have to accept that sin is sin. That is why our world is the way it is. That is why the Israelites kept falling apart in the book of Judges. No one stood up and said enough is enough. Don't take God's grace, love, and mercy for granted. We need to start following him because we want to follow him. We cannot live in this world and in our sin and keep following and molding and churning in for God. It doesn't work that way. So how do we do this? How do we start? Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Stay in relationship. The quote today. People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards comprom compromise and call it tolerance. You hear what he just said? Compromise and tolerance is why we were at. You cannot compromise sin. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indis discipline and lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slosh towards prayerlessness, duel ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godliness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. So real quick, thank you guys for hanging in there with me. So the reflection questions for this week. What are your motivations for going to joining and being part of a church body? Are, there, are you there for God and his purpose and calling or are you are your own purpose and needs? Why do you follow God? Do you follow him unconditionally or do you follow God conditionally when he matches your understanding of life, purpose, worship, obedience, and God? We cannot love God and the world, the things of this world. You are, re you are ready to drop, are you ready to drop your pride, fully submit to his purpose, will and calling, or are you still holding on to things of this world? Um, thank you guys for holding in there with me. I got a little passionate, I know. Um, my heart is just hurting. It, it's breaking because 
you know, you guys have heard me talk about this before. We have people on the right, people on the left. We have people so far on the right that they're condemning and burning everyone to hell. We have the people on the left that are so misshrewed they're taking God's word out of context to justify sin. I'm tired. I'm tired of reading Judges and seeing that our culture, our world, us as believers is doing the same thing. It's got to stop. I'm the first person to give love, grace, and mercy on people that see their sin, are working on their sin, and walking life with them. Even if it takes them 10 years to figure that sin out. We can no longer sit back and be afraid to say, what you're doing is wrong. I cannot accept this. I love you as a person. I'm here for you. But you're, it's not okay anymore. I can't condone what you're doing. It's against God. See, it's not about being on the right or left. It's not about your feelings or my feelings. It's not about your opinion or my opinion. As believers, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is biblical truth and what God says is right and wrong. It doesn't even matter at the end of the day what I feel is right or wrong. It's what God says is right or wrong and what God says and how we're supposed to live our life. Not mine, not yours. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you so much for the fact that we have the Bible and that we can look back and learn from your people. God, my heart just hurts and I can't, I can't keep doing this. God, I, it hurts my heart when people justify sin and then it also hurts my heart when people sit there and crucify and send people to hell because of their actions. Neither are biblical, neither are right, God. You showed us how to be in the middle, which is where you're at. That you can love people and at the same time call sin for what it is. And not justify actions. God, you sent us the perfect example of how to live and how to talk to people and how to treat people. And that was through Jesus. God, I pray for all those listening that we learn myself included, that we learn it's not about our opinion. It's not about how we feel. That biblical truth is biblical truth, whether we like it or not. And that your biblical truth is because you know what we'll do with the things that you've said for us not to do. We see it in the book of Judges. You, they did exactly what you told them not to do. They sinned against you. And their worlds were falling apart because they chose to go against you. Yet we're doing it today in America again. You say, don't do this, and we're doing it, and it's, we're falling apart. God, I pray for America. I pray for our world. I pray for Arizona. God, thank you so much for your love, grace, and mercy, which none of us would be here without it. But God, I pray that we start reading your word for what you're teaching us, not the other way around. God, I pray that we stop making the word say what we want it to say, and that our hearts are open to what you want it to say. God, I pray for those listening that it might have been hurt or offended. And God, that's never my intention, but I'm tired of not being able to feel like I can speak biblical truth. God, this world is about you. It's about speaking truth for you. It's about speaking love. God, I pray for all of us watching. I pray for Riverview that we start standing up and calling sin for sin. But we also are right there to pick them up, love on them, and walk life with them. God, thank you so much for first loving us, even before we knew what it meant to love you. Amen. Have a good week, everybody.